All right, just so you know, I am going to lecture today. We should be able to get this done, hopefully in an hour, going over chapters 10 and 11. But do you ever hear that saying, you know, that somebody said something along the lines of once art imitates life, imitates art, or something like that? I always said that if I wrote a book and I talked about the experiences in my life, most of the ones that are the weirdest, people would say, you made that up. And I would say, I couldn't make up stuff that good. Well, I don't know if you heard the newest. This is not this is not a joke, okay? Guess who lost their domain name? Jeb Bush. So if you go out to jebbush.com, look what happens. Donald Trump bought his domain name. You can't come up with stuff this good. And this guy thinks that he he has the wherewithal to become president. But this, this was actually on, I saw this on TV today, you know, and I, I looked at it and I thought, like I said, you can't make up stuff that good. No, and actually, what also is out there, if you go to, like, register.com or whatever, you can go to there and you can look at lists of names that people have looked at that they haven't registered. Yes. And then you can buy those in case. As right. Sell that's, them. that's parking, and people do that a lot, so. Yeah, All right. Well, We're... All right, we're going to go over chapters 10 and 11, and as mentioned, I believe we can go through both of these, and we can go bo through both of them in an hour. Neither chapter is that long, all right? So what this does is it allows us to finish up here with part two of the book, all right? Rather than going on to part three next week, we're going to build that little game which will give you a chance to look at event listeners and a few other things. So we're going to do that next week. The following week, we'll go on to part three and go over chapters 12 through 15, you know, and then I don't know if we'll have an assignment or if we'll go right back on to 16 through 19. We'll probably go through 12, 13, 14, and 15, have another assignment, then go through 16 through 19, have another assignment. That might be your last assignment. I don't know. We'll see. All right? But I do want to go over as much of this book as we can. And the question got asked to me the other day, well, if we're doing uh, projects and we have to present them at the end of the semester, literally, if you want to, just a couple things. First, you can whatever project you're doing for this class can be the same project or projects you're doing for the other two afternoon classes, the Android and the iPhone, all right? Second, if you want to, and you don't have to do this, but I know some of you in here, for lack of better words, pal around, all right? You're friends with one another. If you want to work on your project with another person, you can do that, but you don't have to, all right? There are people who are in this class that are very much individuals, all right? You may never have even heard them open your, their mouths. All right? And they probably would not want to work with another person. I don't want it set up that, you know, I'm not even going to allow it, you know, that you have three people. Just because, you know, we've had too many problems with that in the past. So if it's you and somebody else and it's not going to happen that way, but let's just pretend, because I'm looking that way, that it was Ben and Luke. All right? They decide they're going to work together. They've worked together on internships and stuff before. But now they're working on the project, and for whatever reason, one of them thinks they're doing the majority of the work and the other one isn't. If they want to go and break up their groups, they don't have to go to court. They don't have to come to me. They just stop working together. So if you'd rather do all this stuff on your own, that's fine. All right? Okay. So in Chapter 10 which starts in your book on page 269, Dynamically Accessing and Manipulating Web Pages with JavaScript and jQuery. What you'll find, and here are our objectives right there, but what you'll find if you look through those objectives is, again, the author has got page almost after page of different, all right, page after page of different uh 
tables with all sorts of information in there. I believe I told you this the other day, but you know the drill. You don't have to do this. But for the class, under the in-class folder, all right, there's all the, the chapter 10 and chapter 11. So there's about a half dozen examples. There's about a half dozen examples. There's about a half dozen. There's more than a half dozen, more than a half dozen, and more than a half dozen. There are somewhere in the vicinity of about 40 different examples. Again, what I did was I went out to either api.jquery.com, all right, or I went out to uh, and, and did a, a Google search, basically, through W3 Schools. So, for example, if I go out here to Port and I take a look at that, this is where I went to get it, this is a description of it, and this is an example of it. All right, if you run this, it looks almost weird. I just picked that one out on purpose. It says, note, if the port number is 80, which is what ours is, some browsers will either display zero or will display nothing. This one displays nothing. It's got the word port, and then there's nothing after it. All right, it doesn't mean that doesn't work, all right, it's just that's the way, for whatever reason, it's being displayed on there. But if you change it, that would be nice. Well, I, I suppose if you change it to another port, yes. All right. So tracking mouse position, manipulating size and other attributes of page elements, hiding and showing elements dynamically, layering page elements, dynamically creating DOM elements, adding and remove classes in jQuery, and modifying the layout of a web page. That's what we're, we're talking about in here. What you'll find when you go through a lot of these examples, if you look up on the screen here, this is, again, what the table that's shown on page 270. If you run these examples, the screen X is going to look just like the page X. It's going to look just like the client X. For whatever reason, all right, it was decided by someone along the way that they were going to provide different ways of doing the same thing. So what I'm telling you is the majority of these, when I keyed them in, they worked. I got some output. Occasionally, one would come in, and if I had time, I tried to debug it. If I didn't have time, I just said, heck with it. All right? But you can see these are all things with coordinates. For instance, if I use the screen X, just so you see this. Again, there's where it's from, and all this does when you run it is I can click anywhere on the screen, and it shows me the coordinates of where I currently am. Now, is that going to help you a lot? It depends on what it is you're trying to do. If Andrew turns around and says, you know, for my project, I'm creating this simple game, then he might be very interested in working with coordinates, an X and a Y coordinate, all right? For many of you, it won't matter at all. But like I said, I just wanted you to make sure you knew these are basically going to look just about all the same when you go run them. All right. You can also set different things in jQuery. All right. So when you look at this, notice what we're doing right here. And remember, anytime you start with a dollar sign, it's jQuery. All right. So what this says, this is going to get the attribute that's called source from an ID, a banner image, right? And it's going to assign that to a variable called state. So what are we doing right there? We're doing a getter, correct? We're grabbing something, we're getting it, and we're just assigning it to a value. All right? Here, we're doing more a setter because we are actually setting a source element. So when you use this, when you use these different things in jQuery, you can use them as either setters when they appear on the right-hand side of an equal, I'm sorry, getters when they appear on the right-hand side of an equal sign, or setters when there's no equal sign in there whatsoever. All right, and the author goes through several different examples of these. All right, he talks about some CSS properties. Sometimes these things are really, really simple. Again, take a look up on the screen here and see what I've got highlighted. This should make sense to all of you. This says, find an element in there with an ID of button A. 
and add to that the CSS cursor property. The cursor property doesn't require, it doesn't require any attributes. So you just do it like that. On the other hand, if we want to go to that same thing and we want to add a border radius to it, the border radius requires two different parameters. So you have to put them both in there, basically for the roundness, etc., of the border. All we're doing right here in both of these examples is we're saying, using jQuery, find an element that meets this criteria and add this particular line of CSS in it. Does that make sense? Now, typically what's going to happen, it's kind of like when, you know, back in the 157 class when you were working and you started to, to basically, after a while, if I'm adding all this different stuff to button A, so I could say dot CSS this, dot CSS that, I can keep going and I can keep going and I can keep going. But there's probably, after a while, there's probably a pretty good chance I'm going to write a, I'm going to want to create a class. So the reason I'm telling you that is if I have a class associated with this, rather than saying dot CSS, I can say dot add class. So rather than having dot CSS this, dot CSS that, dot CSS, etc., and chaining them, which I can do, typically I'll create a class and do an add class. And if I want to remove the class from something, I do a remove class. All right. Next, they talk about different things that you can work with with element, with element height and with element width. So very quickly, if I just show you one of those, So here's height. Again, real simple example. There's a lot of uh, CSS in there, but there's not much, you know. So what is it doing? It's showing you in here what the height of that paragraph is, all right, what the height of the screen is, basically, and what the height of the window is, which is the same height. And again, if you wanted to or needed to, either use that to place things on a page or whatever, you can use height, you can use width. And again, not only are there height and width, there's inner height and inner width. Notice the difference. Those include the padding that are put in there. Sometimes you want browser screen type of information. Remember, you know, this isn't, wasn't that long ago you heard the, the term browser sniffing. And the idea was that if somebody came to your site, you might want to take a look and see what kind of browser they're using. All right, and that stuff I think is in the navigator object. And you can look in there and you can find what, what browser they're using, you can find the version, etc. The problem is there are so many different browsers and there are so many different versions of browsers. I was talking to the class yesterday and I said I believe that Firefox is like on version 43 or something like that. There's no way that you're going to be able to write something that's going to work in every browser and say, oh, check and see if you got Firefox this version, do this. Else, if you have this version, do that. It would just take too much time to do it. But sometimes you like to get browser information for whatever reason, and you might want screen size information for whatever reason, and you may want color information for whatever reason. Now, the example that they show here, this example that's in the book on pages 275, 276, 277, 278, 279, 280, in 281, it's kind of a convoluted example because what they're showing here is all of this stuff. All right? And then when you actually go in there and run it, notice what you get. It's showing you a bunch of information. And this wouldn't be the kind of thing that you'd present to a user, but this might be the kind of thing if you go to work for a company and they say, hey, Zane, I want you to build this site and the majority, let, let's say, for example, it's going to be an intranet site. We all know what intranet means, right? Like we've got an intranet at Blackhawk, so it's just Blackhawk. And, and they say, Zane, you're going to build this intranet site, and the only people who are going to be able to use it are people who work here. And everyone who works here has a 1024 by 768 monitor. They've got this, they've got this. So you could take a look and see all this stuff and make sure that you've got it set up the way that you want it to be set up. All right? So you wouldn't be showing this to other people, 
but it's something you could use as a tool when you're setting up a site or whatever for debugging purposes or for whatever reason you'd need to. And again, quite a bit of, of HTML in here, about 50 lines. All right, quite a bit of jQuery and JavaScript code in here, again, about 35 lines, and about the same amount of CSS. All right. All right. As they mention in here, often you will not know how all the elements that belong on a web page until the user logs in. Why is that? Well, you, you know this kind of thing, that if I work at a company and I log in, I, I might be pushed off to different places on the company site or whatever if I'm a payroll person versus whether I work in accounting or receiving or shipping. It might be totally different as far as where I get placed off. So what they're saying here is what you want, at least at times, is the ability to do things dynamically based either on user input or when they log in or some other factor. And when you do that and you add pages dynamically, there are different ways that you can do it. Here's an example of going in here and adding it using JavaScript. All right, remember that inner HTML. That basically is a JavaScript command that allows you to go in and either add to, modify, or remove um, text that's on a web page. All right, that's not the one that you use in actual jQuery. Rather than the dot inner HTML, you use the dot HTML method. It's a different method, but it works virtually the same way. And you see that right here. If you can add something, you can also remove it. All right. So they show here how you can go in and remove an element. Remember, and when you're working with the DOM, the document object model, virtually everything that's in there is known as a node, N-O-D-E. So here we want to remove a certain node. This, is, this, again, is kind of a goofy example because why would you go and create something and then create something else and then immediately remove it? Well, there's nothing that says that this has to be, this line has to be right after that line. All right, it might be later on in the program or whatever that you want to actually remove something. It's even simpler to do when you're working in jQuery. All right, so notice it says to remove the paragraph elements inside of any div. Okay, and that when you think about it, when you look at that example, I don't know if you agree with this or not, that is unbelievably powerful. Because if I'm going to do that on an entire website, the chances are, if I've got maybe hundreds of divs on my site, I don't want to run a command like that. Because that's going to remove every paragraph inside of every div. That's one of the reasons, again, that you're going to come in and you're going to set up IDs. And instead of saying that div right there, all right, you're either going to say div, pound sign, followed by a name, or just pound sign, followed by a name. Or if there's enough of them, you're going to create a class. All right? Not only can you add that we just looked at and remove that we just finished with, you can replace, which again, you're talking about modifying something that's in there. And there's a lot, again, of power in here. Notice this command, replace all. That is unbelievably powerful. Did you ever do that when you did a copy and replace and you, you hit the replace all and you wish you wouldn't have? All right, that's one of those commands too that you can't control your control Z your way back out of. All right. This is right here. If you understand this, this is a lot of the next section of the book. This is straight jQuery. Remember, if I say equal to, what is that? It's the third one, right? Zero, one, two. So what we're saying right here is after the third paragraph, I want to add a new paragraph. Does that make sense? If there was a paragraph in there previously, it's going to push it down. All right? But this says, this is assuming that I have at least three paragraphs in here, and this will allow me to add a new one. And you can do the same kind of stuff in JavaScript, but it, it involves usually writing more code. And since there's an after, there's also a before. 
I already mentioned to you the add class and the remove class. All right. And we may have talked about this before, we may not have. Have you ever gone out to a website where, as an example, you, they might have a form on it. And if you take your mouse and you mouse over a field on the form, maybe it changes color. Or maybe it does reverse imaging. So instead of a, white, a black text on a white background, it's now white text on a black background. So you put your mouse in there, boom. You take your mouse out again, and then it goes away and it goes back to the way it was. You all know what I'm talking about, right? Well, when you write stuff, especially jQuery, it still supports mouse over and mouse out. And there's not a problem with that. But they thought, well, why, rather than you having to write two different routines, why not just have a hover routine that does the same thing? And it does that with a lot. For instance, there's slide up, slide down, but there's also slide toggle, which will do both. All right? So with most of these things, what, what jQuery does is rather than providing you a way to go up, down, left, right, whatever, it does that, but then it allows you a way to toggle, which will typically mean that you'll write a little bit less code, but it'll do the same thing. <clears throat> in the other example in here, the last example that's in the chapter, I believe, this is on pages 287, 288, 289, 290, 291, and 292, and it's not the last example, all right? But what it does is it says it's time to put everything together again. You'll start with a basic web page and dynamically add, modify, and remove elements based on user interactions, all right? So depending on which of these buttons you click, different things will happen. Again, introducing that idea of interactivity in here. We've talked about this before. Can, some, can someone in this room who's not Mike, all right, tell me what a Z-index is? All right, when you're working with layering, yeah, that's a good start. What about it? It's the order in which things are layered. Okay, we're getting there, but how does it do that? How does it layer? Come on, I know you know this stuff. It uses numbering. The higher the number, the closer the thing comes to the foreground. The lower the number, the closer the thing goes to the background. All right? And you can adjust Z-index if you want to or need to. You can do it using JavaScript. You can do it using jQuery. All right? And the last example in here, they basically set up something that looks like this. And they give you a bunch of options. Here, this stuff is stacked basically on top of one another, all right? And then they come in here and they show you how you can stack it in different ways, all right, using the Z-index. Now, that's it for that chapter. Like I said, not a lot in it, really. So let's finish up. We'll go through Chapter 11. <coughs> And notice there are very few, in this case, there are very few objectives. So chapter 11 starts on page 303. Adding timers to web pages, getting and setting cookies, creating pop-ups. I'm going to say virtually nothing about cookies because we've talked about cookies in the PHP class. You know what a cookie is. All right, you should, by now you should understand the difference between sessions and cookies. All right, so what is the difference between sessions and cookies? Again, not, not everybody at one time. All right, the, the comment that, that Ben made, which is so, very often true, all right, is, is that uh, cookies are oftentimes longer term, whereas sessions typically expire at the end when you log out or whatever, which is, which is normally true. Not necessarily, but it can be. But the big thing is cookies are written to the browser. Sessions exist on the server. I mean, that's the big thing. You still get a session ID on the, on the browser, but, you know, cookies are typically smaller. 
Okay, there's a lot of other things. All right, so the screen object. If you run these and you, you do the available height versus the full height of the screen, I, I think when I ran these, they came, it came up with the exact same thing. I think it was 768. With the width and the available width, it was like 1024. The color depth, the number of bits, um, available display images, I think that was 24 bits. Okay, it's going to differ when you go to different machines, not in this room, but if you ran that kind of stuff on your machines at home, or if you got your laptop with you and you ran it, there's a good chance you'd get different values than what you get here. So they talk about that, they talk about the screen object, and then they talk about the window object. And again, how did I find out about this stuff? Window object methods, all right, W3Schools. And if you look, here are the properties, and that's just about all of them that they just mentioned, and some they didn't, and here are the methods. You start to notice when you look through this, and you see something like blur. Okay, notice what it says. Removes focus from the current window. Well, you know what blur does. And we've, we've looked at blur in terms of going from one form element to another, but you could also use it going from one window to another. All right? Same thing with focus. Rather than setting focus to, a, to an element, you can set it to a window. And again, they go through, there's, there's just, there's a bunch of them in here. The actual browser location, this is the one I mentioned to you before, and I showed you the port one. Okay. <clears throat> We've looked a little bit at this before. Hopefully by now you at least are, I'm not going to even say familiar, but you understand what's in blue up there, that last line that says E dot prevent default. What that's going to do in this code that they have right here is anytime you, you bring up an associated hyperlink and you click on it, it will not leave the page you're on. You're preventing the default action from happening. The default action, of course, being when you have a, uh, a hyperlink would be to, you know, open up that address that's in the hyperlink and it's in the href part of it. They show you some stuff here with cookies. So they allow you to set cookies, get cookies, and delete cookies right here. I'm not going to go through that anymore. And really, there's not much more left in the chapter. The only other thing I'd mention is what they show here that's on page, the bottom of page 313. All right. And by now, you've all written alerts, and that's basically an alert right there. You've all done input boxes in JavaScript, and that's basically an input box. And you may or may not have worked with a confirm. Confirm is like an alert, but confirm, you typically are asking a question, and the person can either click OK or they can click Cancel. And you can put code for either, you know, in for either one. So we've done this, and they, they have you create just a simple alert box, just a simple uh, confirm box, and just a simple uh, input box or prompt, all right? And the last thing that's in this chapter, setting timers. And the key thing to realize in here is this, set timeout versus this, set interval, all right? And I may have even mentioned this the other day, but it wasn't that long ago, maybe in the mid-90s, there was no Microsoft Word. People used Word Perfect, all right? And when they used Word Perfect, a lot of times what would happen is you'd be typing away on a document and by default, every 15 minutes, you'd get a message on the bottom of your screen that would say WordPerfect has auto-saved your document because there was a set interval in there that said every 15 minutes, if you have not previously saved, save for the person. So, you know, the old try to protect you from you kind of an idea. All right. On the other hand, the set timeout is a one-time shot. So look at it, you know, I don't know if you've ever had one of these or at least have seen one, but if you remember in the, quote, olden days, you know, before even before clock radios, people had the old wind-up alarm clocks. All right, you set it for 6 in the morning. 
if you turned it off and you fell back asleep, you were hosed. All right, because there was no snooze button or anything like that on there. That's a set timeout. It's a one-time shot. But then with the advent of clock radios and whatever, all right, and better alarm clocks, now you've got intervals where typically after 9, 10 minutes or whatever, if you press snooze, it'll go off again. And you can do that for an hour or you can do it whatever. So, again, the big difference is set timeout is a one-time shot. Set interval, you can set it to, to, to happen many times. All right? And you can also clear the timeouts and you can clear the intervals. All right? And that's it. So, again, next week in here, we will be, literally, we will be creating that game as a class. All right? Taking a break from what we've been working on. Okay? And then we're going to just jump right back into it again. All right? And that's all that I had. <laughs>